Lord, we love you. We give you thanks and praise for this day. What a good God you are. Angels bow before you. Heaven and earth adore you. Your mighty God, we celebrate you. We honor you. We thank you for the opportunity to get right. Thank you for not leaving us in our wrongness. Thank you for not leaving us in our pits of despair. Today, release something in this space. As your word goes forth, God, I pray that it goes forth with such clarity and might that every demon from hell would be vanished. God, I come against every attack of the enemy. And God, we pray that your blessings would rain down upon your people. God, for those that are sitting around me, those that are near me right now, those that are on the East City campus, I pray right now, God, in the name of the Lord, God, that you would remove every distraction, that you would heal and deliver for your name's sake. I pray right now, God, that there will be a spirit of restoration, a spirit of recovery. I pray, God, that somebody would be set free today. So, God, I pray that you would grant us the ability to rightly divide your word, that you would grant us the ability as your sons and daughters to intelligently hear not what the man is saying, but what your spirit is saying to the church. So, Holy Spirit, heal and deliver according to your word. Save for your name's sake. Speak, Lord. We're listening. In Jesus' name, amen and amen again. Come on, give God thanks in here. Come on, before we read the text, let's uh, make our affirmation together with one voice. It's not call and response, y'all. It's not me saying it and y'all saying it. It is together with one voice because there is power in unity. Amen. Come on, there is power. I'm waiting for them to put it on screen because some of y'all don't know it. So come on, let's say it together, but y'all going to memorize it. So let's come on, let's say it together. Come on. I am what God says I am. I have what God says I have. I can do what God says I can do. I'm ready to receive the word of God. I take authority over every hindrance. I set myself in agreement with God's plan for my life. When I leave this place, I'll never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody say, I know that's right. Amen. Luke chapter 19 and the 28th verse, if you grab your Bible and turn there, while you're getting to Luke chapter 19 and verse 28, allow me to extend my words of appreciation um, to our executive pastor, Kyle, and our associate pastor, Stephanie, and the ministers, and all those who have been a minister, Dwight, all of those who have been ministering, thank you for your kind words and expressions and support of the ministry during these last five weeks. But I got to tell you, I'm glad to be back. So, um, and I'm excited about this week. Uh, Minister Beach referenced this. I can't underscore it enough. Um, a third of all the Gospels. Jesus ministered for three and a half years. A third of everything written about those three and a half years are about his last eight days. It is without question, disproportionate amount of time is given from Palm Sunday to Easter. If there is ever a week in the life of a Christian where you drop everything, make the sacrifice, it is Holy Week. And so, and so we, we're ministering today. And then we have Tuesday Bible study. I'm going to suspend my Bible study and minister a word just about Holy Week um, in the evening. Then we have, we have uh, Wednesdays in the Word. And then we have Good Friday with seven words. And y'all, y'all got it easy. How many of y'all remember? I don't know. Do you remember this, Ryan? How many of y'all remember the Good Friday where we did 14 words? We did seven from 12 to three and seven more from six to nine. And so, so we're going to minister together. I'm telling you, it's going to be life-changing. And then Easter Sunday, ladies, the women are the first to, to discover the empty tomb. So the women will be the first to worship the Lord on Easter Sunday. Amen? Amen. So Luke chapter 19, verse 28, if you have it, say, I got it. 
And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem when he drew near to Bethpage and Bethany at the mount that is called Olivet. He sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away and found it, just as he had told them. And as they were untying the coat, its owner said to them, why are you untying the coat? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the coat, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Say amen if you can. Before you take your seat, look at somebody, look at somebody, give them this quick message. Look at somebody, it's a question. Say, neighbor, neighbor. what's all the shouting about? <laughs> amen, amen. You can have your seats today. I want to tag this text, what's all the shouting about? It is always interesting to me how different groups can have the same experience with the same person and yet have two different opinions about who that person is. As Jesus enters the city, the crowd asked the question, who is this? Who is this that they throw their cloaks on him? Who is this that they wave palm branches, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? Who is this? Who is this? And part of the shout, before I unpack the text, part of the shout, y'all, is because of who God is. Now, now, if you're in the room saved, the very thought of God makes you want to shout. If you're in the room saved, the very name of Jesus makes you, you don't need your, you don't need your pump prime. You don't need anybody with a microphone to say one, two, three, shout. You don't need to have a Hammond organ kind of get you going. If you just, is there anybody here that knows who he is? And because I know who he is, well, if you don't know, let me help you for a moment because there might be somebody in here not saved. He is the lamb of the Old Testament. He is the rock that is smitten by Moses. He is the brazen serpent that is lifted up in the wilderness. He is the ark that is built by Noah. He is the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the coronation of the king. When you know him, it makes you want to shout. Sometimes I shout just because I know who he is. And putting all of that aside, anybody here know him to be a deliverer? Anybody here ever been bound and struggling? And he, anybody here know him to be a savior? I was sinking in sin. And then anybody here, has he ever healed your body? You were struggling and you were sick. And then somewhere along the line, you touched the hem of his garment. Tell your neighbor, sometimes I'm shouting just because of who he is. It, it, let me just set this up. But Ryan, sometimes I shout because of how he works. You ever been in a mess 
and you look up in some kind of way, he has turned your mess into something that has forever changed your life. Is there anybody with a all things work together for good kind of testimony? Have you ever been down and out and God some kind of way? I, I just shout because of how he works. I, I, who he is, but how he works. How he takes me being dumb and does something good with it. How he forgives me in my moment of struggle. How, how, how he uses people other folk didn't think were usable. I, I just, I love who he is. Makes me shout, right? But how he works makes me shout, Joy. But, but, but sometimes I shout because of what God uses. It... I've seen him use sickness. I've seen him use a loss of job. I've seen him lose mistakes. And things that you would think would destroy somebody winds up being a tool in the arsenal of God to bring you out to a better place. I'm sorry, I got to park here for a moment because the Lord is telling me to tell somebody, you're not done. God is not done with you. It is not over yet. That mistake you made, that hang up in your life, all it is is one more. Tell your neighbor, it's one more tool. It, 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 it who he is. What, how he works, what he uses. And all of that is evidence in our text today. The scene of our text is a familiar one. If you've been around here for 17 years, you've heard me preach it 17 times. If not the Matthew ver or the Luke verse, but somewhere in the Gospels, you're going to know Palm Sunday, this is the passage the pastor going to preach. It's... it's the triumphant entry that I got I got to put a pin in there for a second the triumphal entry that that means before he got to Calvary he already had triumph you see he was not triumphant because of what folks said about him if folk did not say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, he didn't have to worry about that because he was coming in knowing who he was. Can I pause here and minister that to somebody? You better stop waiting for other people to give you affirmation before you be confident in who you are. You better show up in the relationship. I'm sorry, the Lord is nudging me a little bit. The Lord is telling me to tell somebody, if you don't know who you are going in, then you don't have no reason to be in it. You got to know who you are. You don't need no man telling you you fine. You're supposed to know that going in. You don't, you don't need nobody patting you on the back and affirming you. Tell somebody, I already know that. I already know I'm his child. I already know I'm all that. I already know I'm called. I already know I'm anointed. I already, this is the triumphant entry into Jesus and what blows my mind y'all help me get through this introduction what blows my mind like it does every year Robin is the donkey and and I said I promised myself Lord I'm, I'm not talking about this donkey no more I'm preached donkeyology. I'm preached the donkey ministry. I'm preached the donkey in me. I can't shake the donkey. And, and because here it is, Lo. This is what blows my mind. Jesus rides on the donkey. Jesus is the second person of the Godhead. So to say Jesus is riding the donkey is to say Jesus to say God is riding the donkey. Which is to say God is on the donkey. And I got to thinking about that thing. Some of us come to church and no evidence of God being on me. 
Some of us will preach in pulpits with no evidence of God being on me. And I got to thinking about this thing. God, if the church needed anything, anything right now in this year of 2022, I need evidence that God is on me. Is there anybody here that wants to live in such a way that even your enemies know that God is on you? It, I, I, we, we, have, we have more, John, than any other time in recorded history. We've got nonprofits, programs, budgets, buildings, cash, causes, but oftentimes no evidence that God is on us. We, we are doing less than we've ever have done before. Why? Because God is not always on us. We, we've got PowerPoint, multimedia, sound systems, LED walls, million dollar budgets, uh, and the church got more done with no social media. I don't have a lot of amens. The early church did not have Facebook. The early church did not have any avenue to disclose its drama. That's, that's a whole nother sermon right there. Tell your neighbor, stop disclosing your drama. Just, just come on. Uh, it, they, they couldn't keep up with trends on Twitter. And even though they did not have PowerPoint and multimedia and social media and glamour and glitz, when you begin looking at them according to the Bible, they were described as men and women that turned the world upside down. How in the world, without all of the trappings, do I still get to turn the world upside down? And the reason is because they got God on them. See, there is an amazing discovery for me with this. When I look at this donkey who has God on him, and I know sometimes as Christians, we don't have God on us. What evidence is, Tanya, is that if God can get on a donkey, I won't say the other word I want to say. Let me help y'all get there. If God can get on a colt, if God can get on a... Look at your neighbor and say, what's your problem? It, 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 it. The fact that God can get on a donkey gives us a truth that God can use anybody, that God can use you anywhere, at any time, and in any place to accomplish anything. Because think about it. Only thing God can work with are sinners. Everybody who sang today is a sinner. Y'all not talking. The whole band. Y'all not talking. Everybody in the nursery right now. Pastor, why are you reminding us of this? Because we've got to stop looking down on people because of their mistakes and their proclivities and recognize that God has to use folk that are messed up. He has to use folk that have issues and struggles. And when he does it, God will take a nobody and make them a somebody. When he does it, God will take nothing and accomplish something. When he does it, God will take the useless and make them useful. And when he does it, he'll take the weak and make them warriors. I wish I had somebody that could get in this message. Have you ever been beaten and then he makes you somebody brave? Have you ever been meager and he makes you into somebody mighty? Have you ever been feeble and he makes you into somebody faithful? See, this is why God always qualifies the called. <laughs> you 
you can't, you can't, you're not, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't have a, you don't have a resume. You don't have the curriculum vitae. You don't have enough publications with your name. No, you don't have the right pedigree. No, you got it wrong. God is not trying to call qualified people. He's trying to qualify called people. Preach Pastor Galea. Oh, y'all don't believe me. Y'all don't believe me? Okay, okay, okay. Y'all don't believe me? If y'all have a devotion life, every passage of scripture you read from a devotion life is somebody that was once jacked up. Y'all not talking to me, but that's all right. You don't have no devotion where you spend a bunch of time Quoting angels. No, you quote drunks like Noah. I'm a priest as whether you, 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 you quote daydreamers like Isaac. You, you quote liars like y'all don't like Jacob. You quote we quote abused people like Joseph. We quote stutterers like Moses. We quote fearful people like Gideon. We quote womanizers like Samson. It, we quote murderous adulterers like David. We're brand, we are brand, as matter of fact, we like his stuff so much we sing it and memorize it. We like runaways like Jonah and widows like Naomi and people who go broke and have to file bankruptcy like Job. And I want to minister this. I'm going to give you the first point. There is no dysfunction that God can't dismiss. Y'all missed a good place for the whole room to clap their hands. I'm going to say it again. There is no dysfunction that God can't dismiss. Now put your hands together and thank God for that. So we surround ourselves. Dysfunctional people. But we have God on us. And when God is on us, even if I am a bound donkey who has never left home and never been written. God can use me. So with this image of God riding on a donkey, I want to leave us with three thoughts this Palm Sunday. First thing that I want to leave us with, family, is the reason you ought be shouting. This is what the shouting is about. Number one, the shouting is about the fact that you have been sought for a greater purpose. Elbow somebody or nudge them and tell them greater. Just, just give them that one word. Tell them greater. <laughs> See, one of the aspects of God's sovereignty is that God uses pagans. He uses heathens. He uses infidels. He uses unbelievers. And in order for God to use us, I need you to grab this. The first thing that has to happen is that I have to get redeemed. You've heard me talk about this donkey in previous for some of you, when other years, when I've raised it up, it took y'all a while to grab a hold of it. Because you're like, how in the world? I want you to get this. He, he sought, he seeks the donkey. He, he, he says, he says, go to Bethpage, Mount Olivet, and you will find straightway a donkey, a colt, never been sad on, loose it, and say, I have need of it. Now, now, this is going to make you shout if you're paying attention. The donkey has no reasoning skills. He, 
he has no idea he's being sought. He's minding his business. He's doing what he's always done. I'm about to put this on your lap. While you are doing your normal routine, I want you to hear from your pastor. You are being sought for a greater purpose. While you are minding your business, tell your neighbor you're being sought for a greater purpose. Oh, I'm gonna give y'all something to shout about. While you're being overlooked, you're being sought for a greater purpose. I said, while you're being overlooked, while you're being minimized, while you are being counted out, you are being sought for a greater purpose. Oh, God. See, you don't need no attention-seeking behavior for Jesus. You can just sit in the corner and mind your own business, and other folk are trying get his attention, and he'll tag you. I need you to get this. He's not seeking the horse. He's seeking, seeking a donkey. Under Levitical law, the donkey is considered unclean. See, y'all too holy. Y'all don't like the thought that God is seeking unclean people. That he's seeking the guy selling drugs. He's seeking the sister that's prostituting. He's seeking the folk that's out there messing up their life. He is seeking them. And y'all better stop looking at me with that attitude because you used to be that man. You used to be that woman. And thanks be to God, when I wasn't thinking about him, he was thinking about me. And I'm grateful to God that one day in the midst of my mess, he came seeking me. Oh, God. See, according to Levitical law, he was unclean because he did not chew the cud. He was unclean because he, he had cloven hoofs. He was considered what they would say doubly cursed. He was cursed inside and outside. He was not redeemed inwardly, and he was jacked up outwardly. But... The law made provision for him. The provision the law made is that if a lamb died for it, if the lamb offered the proper sacrifice, then that, that colt, that donkey, would be considered redeemed. Sound like somebody you know? I don't know about you, but I'm grateful to God that the lamb of God took my place. I'm grateful to God that the Lamb of God found me when I was vile and I was wretched. And here's the issue I want you to see. This donkey is only alive because of redemption of a lamb that sacrificed. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. So he has been given life because of the lamb. Come close, come close, come close. But he's still bound. How many people am I preaching to that you've been given life because of the lamb, but you're still in bondage to something that won't let you operate in the liberty that God has called you to operate? See, some of us are saved, but we ain't set free yet. We've been given life, but there's not liberty yet. Can I, can I go ahead and admit, I'm a minister, whether y'all want to hear it or not. If you came to this church from jail, you came to this church from, from, from pole dancing, you came to this church from tricking in the streets, you came to this church, you came to this church get banging, selling drugs, 
and you know you're saved. But you don't dare serve in a ministry because you're afraid of what other people knew about you in terms of what you used to be. Well, folk don't have heaven or hell to put you in. Baby, you don't just have life, you have liberty. Tell your neighbor, I've got liberty. You, true freedom only comes when the purpose of the master is being served. So I'm going to go ahead and kill the demon. Wherever you came from, we don't care. Come on, help me. Look at your neighbor. Tell him I don't care about all that. I, all I know is you're saved now. All I know is I'm here now. Is there anybody in her church on Palm Sunday that knows you have a past, but you refuse to let other folk keep you stuck in it? I've been set free. I'm going to go ahead and minister it. God has saved you not just to go to heaven, but to get out of hell. He has saved you so that every compulsion and every obsession and every addiction and every fear and all of your bitterness can be released. See, liberation is not only being set free from sin, but it's also freeing people to pursue their potential. See, some of y'all just been set free from sin. You need to be set free to go do what God called you to do. And I'm, y'all, sometimes the release is not just physical. Sometimes the release is spiritual and emotional. Let me come get y'all. Let me come get y'all for a moment. Some of you not in the relationship anymore physically, but emotionally you still stuck in it. You, you, you left that other city 10 years ago, but emotionally you still there. I need you to hear your pastor tell you, you have been sought for a greater purpose. There's a second thing, though, the shout is about. It's not just to be about being sought for a greater purpose. But the second thing the shout is about is about this donkey has been secured for a greater presence. He has been secured by a greater presence. I, it, the donkey, I want you to understand something. In the Palestinian world, donkeys were bred for certain purposes. Like horses are bred for certain purposes. You had donkeys that were bred uh, to, to run. But you had donkeys that were bred as what was called a beast of burden. Which means it was bred specifically to carry other people's weight. But in the midst of it being bred as a beast of burden... It developed a natural proclivity to fight back. It, it, I want you to grab this, y'all. So because the donkey had so much fight in him, nobody could secure him. It, why do we fight so much? Because sometimes, y'all don't want to say amen, but I'm going to say it. We don't like authority. So he, Jesus going to say, look, he's never felt comfortable with anybody else. Everyone else he has fought against. But you bring him to me. Other folk can't settle him like I can. Other folk can't get him to feel safe like I can. He, he, he's going to be 
curious about other folks' motives, but he's going to sense something in me. And I want you to grab what I'm about to teach us. Sometimes we come to church so distraught, so beaten down, so worn out by carrying other people's burdens that it is our natural tendency that even when somebody is trying to help me to keep bucking against them, to keep fighting. And the Lord told me to tell our church, it's time to stop fighting. We, we, we wind up fighting because of exposures we've had to other people that didn't mean us well. Preach Pastor Gail, you're... We wind up fighting because other folk were trying to take advantage of me and other folk had an agenda for me. And so sometimes the exposure of other people caused the donkey in me to keep fighting. But I'm here to tell you Jesus is different. And he's not in the game to harm you or to damage you. But he wants you to get to a point where you start settling yourself down and recognizing, you know what, this is a greater presence. Sometimes I keep fighting because of my environment. Like to this day, old as I am, old as I'm getting. To this day, I could go to a four or five star restaurant to this day where I know nothing going to happen. But I'm not going to sit with my back to the door. Because... Where I came from, you had to see the door. Because you just don't never know who's stopping in. You don't never know who got what. Come on, is anybody other than me still got that demon in you, that spirit in you? <laughs> so sometimes I'm fighting because of my environment. No man has ever been good to you. So you fight the good one you just met. No, no, no pastor did the right thing with the money and the people. So you fight the new church. And God has sent me to tell us on this Palm Sunday, it's time to stop fighting. Sometimes I'm fighting because of my exposure. Sometimes I'm fighting because of my environment. But sometimes I'm fighting because of my errors. Because I've just made some mistakes. Because I've spent some time in dum-dum land. Because I spent moments where everybody saw it but me. Let me get the middle of the room because they're not ready for that. I, I spent time where everybody was telling me. But I just so googly eyed I couldn't see it. And if I'm talking to you, don't worry, the invitation is coming soon. And you can leave all of that behind you. Because what I want you to grab in your spirit, y'all, that God is not running a lottery system. That God is not spinning a roulette wheel. That there is a gift and there is a talent and there is an ability that you have. And that God wants us to recognize, regardless of how untrained and how unlearned and how unrolled, this mule, this donkey, this colt never bucked, never snorted, never fought, never resisted Jesus when he mounted on it. And God has been saying for years to you, trust me, but you keep fighting him. He's been saying to you for years, this is the day of your salvation, but you keep fighting him. And God is saying to us today that you have been secured by a greater person. That what God wants for us is to be rescued and then resuscitated so we can be released. I'm almost done. What is all the shouting about in this text, Pastor? Shouting because I've been sought for a greater purpose. I'm shouting because I've been secured by a greater person. But finally, the shout is about the fact that we have been satisfied by a greater plan. Whew. Verse 38, they begin saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
And Pastor, why is that significant? It is significant because the writer of the triumphant entry of Jesus begins talking about this as a fulfillment of prophecy. It's a fulfillment of prophecy that was spoken by the prophet Zechariah some 500 years earlier. It's not just about him going down a dirt road on one day. No, this was a greater plan. This was the fulfillment of prophecy from some, as I said, 500 years earlier. And this is what I want you to get. When you get God on you, you begin to fulfill God's will for your life. When you get God on you, you start to discover the reason for your existence. When you get God on you, he starts opening doors. When you get God on you, he starts giving you favor. When you get God on you, he starts giving promotion and opportunity. When you get God on you, you start seeing things you never saw. When you get God on you, you start recognizing that I've been called for something greater, but that God has given me a greater plan. I'm about to prophesy in this house. I'm about to speak over this house. What do you mean? Pastor, when you say prophecy, I've been doing it all sermon, but I specify this for a reason. Because when I say to y'all, I'm about to speak prophecy over the house, what I'm saying is I'm about to intensify the truth I've been giving you. I'm about to put it in your lap because I know you've been hearing it and you think some of this stuff is just for certain people, but not for you. But what I'm about to say to you right now is for you specifically. That God is saying, when you get God on you, tell your neighbor, when you get God on you. When you get God on you, favor starts to pour down. When you get God on you, I'm going for it, y'all. When you get God on you, you start to accomplish things on steroids. Y'all didn't catch it. See, when you get God on you, he starts letting you accomplish things exponentially. Not incrementally. Tell your neighbor, not incrementally, but exponentially. I'm about to prophesy over this house. Hope y'all ready for these. The Lord gave me four words to tell us. Discovery, opportunity, favor, and fulfillment. One more time. Discovery. Come on, shout them out. Opportunity. Favor, fulfillment. This is what the Lord is saying on Palm Sunday. When God gets on you, you start to discover that you have been made for a greater purpose. I've not been made to be your doormat. I've not been made to be less than. I've not been made to be trampled on. I've not been made to stay bound up in a corner. Nudge your neighbor and tell him you got a better purpose. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to people that God has you in a spirit and a moment of discovery. I've been made for more than this. I've been made for better than this. I know you only see me as a donkey, but I'm in a moment of discovery. Can I go ahead and say this thing? God just told me, brother, you better up your game because she just discovered something. Sister, you better up your game because I... The stuff I used to settle for, I ain't settling for it no more. The stuff I used to take, I ain't taking no more. Somebody shout, discovery. But it's not just discovery over the house. The Lord is saying opportunity. Somebody shout, opportunity. That means God is not going to be unkind to you. He's not going to just let you discover it. He's going to open up a door where you can fulfill it. Somebody shout discovery. Somebody shout opportunity. So God is going to show you a door. But at first the door going to be shut, which is the third thing I'm speaking over the house, which is favor. Favor means God is going to call some folk to like you that you don't even know. He's going to call some folk to bless you and you don't even know their name. He's going to call some folk to give you a shot and you're not even going to know who they are. Somebody shout favor. If you receive it, say I receive it. 
and then there's gonna be fulfillment. Now I'm gonna do something I've never done before. This is the only time by in all of the Bible that Jesus plans and promotes a public demonstration. If you remember the rest of the times, folk would try to make a big deal about him. He said, no, nah, shh. Don't nobody tell him, don't, I ain't, I ain't said, don't tell him, shh. In the triumphant entry, he plans and promotes a public demonstration. So since Jesus planned and promoted a public demonstration, I'm going to follow his footsteps. And we're going to plan and promote a public demonstration. But in order to promote the public demonstration, you got to have something in your hand. So we're going to give you something in your hand. And when you get this in your hand, you better get ready to acknowledge that he is king of kings and lord of lords. Again, it's the only time in the scriptures he plans and promotes a public demonstration. The last part of this is once you know what God has done in your life, you begin to release it out of your mouth. And I want to invite us, y'all. And the, They're passing out palms. Lord, bless these palms right now. But God, I'm not going to avoid any longer acknowledging who you are. There were some folk in the crowd. There were different groups of people with different mindsets in the crowd. Some folk did not understand who Jesus was. So his Pharisees, listen to me, y'all. His Pharisees say, why are they shouting about you? What's the shout about? Jesus said, let me tell you something. If they don't open up your mouth, the rocks will make some noise for me. And I got to thinking about it. I refuse to let a rock cry out in Word Tabernacle Church. Now, I want you to think about this thing for a moment. Tell your neighbor he didn't have to choose you. He could have chose an alligator to grunt it out. He could have chose a bat to screech it out. He could have called a bear to growl it out. He could have called a camel to grunt it out. He could have called a chicken to cluck it out. He could have called a cock to crow it out, but he didn't do that. Tell your neighbor, he called me. And since he called you, I want to dare you to begin opening up your mouth, waving your branches. He is king of Praise for your future. That's what the shout is about. The shout is about my purpose. The shout is about a greater presence. The shout is about a greater plan. give you biblical context real fast I'm done and I'm opening up the altar Habakkuk chapter 2 Habakkuk chapter 2 when he says the rocks are gonna cry out the reference is to Habakkuk chapter 2 in Habakkuk chapter 2 the stones crying out is a relationship about judgment this is what God is saying. If I haven't been good enough for you, for you to make no noise about me, then the only thing left for you is judgment. 
and I don't know about you, but I refuse to be found quiet. I refuse to be found not praising God. I refuse to be found not worshiping. I refuse to be found not shouting. I refuse.